sometimes I walk away from here. I think my microphone's on here, so I'll stand over here. But anyway, so if you do miss class, um, we'll have at least a recording of what goes on in the first part. Uh, this is going to be an interactive class, so there will be times, hopefully, where we get started in maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then the rest of the class, we're going to be giving you working on some activity, some active learning as you go through. So I'll explain that a little bit later as well. Um, also, I'll, I'll tell you at the beginning, um, I'm dyslexic, and what that means is I, I can see things backwards and forwards, and sometimes when I talk, I talk backwards and forwards and in circles, so um, sometimes I forget what I'm talking about, so we'll come back to it, but uh, it's what has helped me to sort of be a good math teacher. It's not that I love math, that's not why I teach math, it's because I almost dropped out of college because of math, but I, I had a professor who was also dyslexic, taught me how to use it as a, a strength to get through and to understand math. And so I found I might be able to help you if you have a similar type way of, of seeing things, maybe transposing numbers or, or things. So we'll, we'll go through that. So, Bottom line is, is what we're here to teach you is not necessarily the content of algebra and trig, although we will, it, it'll be in there. We're wanting to help you see mathematics as um, a tool for measuring change, because that's calculus. And, when, and the thing is, is you could be pretty good at algebra, pretty good at trig, but when you get to calculus, that's the mathematics of change and things are moving all the time and if you're like me, that's where I hit the wall. And I said, this, this is different than what I, because algebra, what we, you know, we're looking for an answer at a particular time. Calculus, we're looking, well, what if at two in the morning, what was it? What if, you know, we're looking at things as they change. And to do that, um, we need to understand things like what really is a variable. And so we, we put the focus in the class on that. Some of the language that gets used in this class is gonna be a little foreign. I mean, some of you maybe think math is a foreign language already, but uh, some of the language they use here is, is, is different. But once you get it down, the good news is, is in this class, the homework is very similar. The way they have it questioned in the homework is very similar to how it's worded on the, the, the test as well. So it's a class that once you've done the homework, you've gone through it, kind of get to where you understand what it's talking about, you'll be fine on the tests. Okay, so that's why we stick with this, this curriculum. I'm also the course coordinator for the online version of Math 170, uh, which is sort of a different thing because that, that it's a seven and a half week course, it's all online, and basically it's just about the content of algebra and trig, and you know, you get through, but we don't get as much into some of the, uh, the nuances of what, what a variable is and such, okay? So, um, I'll start off with a little bit of introducing you. This is, uh, I'm Turtle Mountain Chippewa, uh, the little reservation up in North Dakota, 20 miles from the Canadian border. And uh, my grandfather was Chippewa and Cree from up in Canada. And so that's my background. I didn't grow up on the reservation. I grew up over in, uh, I was born in Seattle, grew up in Portland, Oregon, uh, and now I'm down here. Taught at Oregon State for six years, then Corvallis. Anyone from the Northwest? Seattle people, Oregon people, all right. So got some, got some homies, okay. Uh, since I've been, I came down to Arizona in 2004, I taught at Scottsdale Community College. Anyone know where that is? It's up the street here. Any, any other artichokes in the room? No, nobody went there, okay. So artichokes is their uh, mascot. Anyway, I, so since I've been here, I've worked with a number of uh, the local tribes, Paskiyaki, I've done some uh, math work with, uh, of course, the uh, Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community and the Gila River community right here locally. Uh, and actually Scottsdale leases its land that it sits on Scottsdale Community College uh, from the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community. So I came up with this uh, Indigenous Scholars Institute in I think we teach from the bottom up, so it, usually you're taught to read from the top down, but I like to change things around the way we do things. And so this first 20 minutes of class, 
don't worry about taking notes. Just kind of absorb it. And what I'm going to do is present sort of a way of uh, one of the difficult sides of learning math. Now, if you don't have any problems with learning math, you can maybe, okay, I don't have to worry about it. But if you've had problems at any time, struggles, most of us have had some struggles. If you haven't had any struggles, then you probably aren't in this class, right? So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, maybe I will. There we go. Um, some brain research that provides clues about uh, difficulties in learning math and uh, anxiety, maybe that comes up. So, and again, you might not have specifically math anxiety, you might just have test anxiety, but there's, there's anxiety. Um, and in fact, we want some anxiety. I mean, right? Get, that's what gets you out of bed. You, you know, I gotta go to school. Otherwise, we don't care about anything, then we don't go on. So, actually, I was supposed to delete this. The questions will appear. Oh yeah, good. So, first of all, Here's a little bit of research specifically about learning math. Okay. How many of you know what the amygdala is? There's a lot of research out there about that. If you don't, it's the part of the brain, it's a little part of the brain in here, uh, that basically deals with the emotional side of our life. And oftentimes things will come into the amygdala, and the amygdala is also the place that is sort of our fight or flight. If we get scared, you know, we're going to get ready to either run away or, you know, deal with it. So that's the stress area. Uh, what happens when we take in a math problem, what researchers have found, is that oftentimes it's processed through the amygdala. And so while you're reading about numbers and facts and, and you know, the train A is going from this station to that station, what you're thinking about is some emotional things that may have come up. Um, and what happens is that those emotions can take over and you're not able to really process all the information for that problem. It may be that third grade teacher who made you come to the board and you know berated you or something. Or with me it was my, let's see, it was my, actually it was my trig teacher in, uh, when was that? Was that was ninth grade. That's when I, it was 10th grade. Actually, I dropped out of math because he just, I don't, he had something for me. He's also my driver's ed teacher I had over summer and I thought we had a good relationship. I got in his trade class and he just started picking on me and stuff. So I dropped out of Cherrick and I didn't take math for the rest of my high school. I thought I was going to show them, right? And I got to college, I said, oh, now I'm behind. But we got there, okay? So even they find something like, you know, a teacher frowning face that can cause that amygdala, that, you know, that thing that, I just want to get out of here. I don't want to deal with this problem. So um, one of the things they found, though, is that this, the stress thing from the amygdala can affect people the most who care the most. They might be the most enthusiastic about learning math, and that's what causes you to get stressed out, because you really want to understand, want to learn. And again, that's where I was, and I am still at times. So how can we deal with this, this concept or what's gonna to happen to us is that when we take in math information, it's gonna, we, we've got this emotional side to deal with, right? We've gotta learn a way uh, to help us out. So I learned that brain functions and we've got here, um, there's some place here it talks about, oh, here's mental math, this part of the brain, this is uh, the right brain. And one of the things you're gonna see, we'll get to here closely, Look at where the fingers are. The body sensations are right here next to where the math part of the brain is. How many of you use your hands to do math? Maybe do a little counting. Yeah, I do. Sometimes I'll do it under the table because people will see, you're a math teacher. What are you doing? You're using your hands. It helps. And what we're going to see, I'm going to show you an actual uh, way from about 500 years ago that was in a math textbook of how to use your, math, your hands to do some multiplication. Uh, and one of the things I have found is that once you start using your fingers, you're now taking the, the focus from the amygdala, the emotional part, to a mechanical part of the brain that is right next to the math part of the brain. Well, what about the left side of the brain? The left side of the brain, same type of thing. Here's the, this is where the symbol processing goes on, math symbols, and look what's right next to the fingers again. So as we start moving, 
then we start activating a part of the brain that can deal with the math stuff. But how many of you, if you start fidgeting and moving in class, how many teachers, hey, settle down, you know, you're supposed to be quiet. I'm the teacher, right? I'm up here, you're supposed to listen. We don't let people use their hands, move around. Um, so that's part of, of what we want you to do. Is, is, and that's part of the reason the curriculum we're using will be a little bit of here's how to do it, we'll get you started. We want you talking with each other. We want you moving around, getting comfortable as much as you can in these sort of chairs. This class is actually best. Uh, everyone else has like 40 students in their class. Come on in. Uh, we've got 125, I think. So, uh, and we're in like this lecture thing. So we'll, we'll make it all work. Okay. But just think about that. This emotional memory part. That's where, you know, you get. That's where the stress is all either hanging. If we can just move out of there, then we can deal with the stress in a way that is uh, beneficial. So. Uh, some questions. I want you to think about these. Uh, do you know why uh, there are 60 seconds in a minute? 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. Uh, do you know why in the USA we buy our eggs in, in dozens and 12 and while well, most of Asia, if you go there, we buy them in groups of 10. And I've experienced that. I, uh, I asked that question. You know, wow. Go get a dozen eggs. Well, nope, I'm in Th my wife's from Thailand. I go there, they sell them in a box of 10, actually in a bag of 10. So, uh, anyone got any answers? Have you ever thought of that though? No? Have you ever had to do the math of time, maybe in elementary school, where you had to add some, isn't that hard? Because it's based on 60 seconds. It's not 100. It would be really nice if there was 100 seconds in a minute, because then it would be like decimal. We could use decimals. Uh, so this really, and the reason we're going to see is that, it's a, that time was set up by people who did a different type of math. And this is one of the things that, that in education they generally don't tell you is that there are different types of math. Well, internationally, we've kind of agreed upon a type of math we do, and we have it in our schools. As we were tribal peoples, we had various different ways of looking at math, and we're going we're to get down into that. And once we start to understand that, we can understand, okay, that's why we have this dozen, because that's a cultural thing. When we start looking at how math was developed, we look at the culture of math, and we see that, okay, I see this different, this is different. Trigonometry actually was, is a different type of math than algebra, because it comes from primarily the Babylonians, and, and we're going to look at, they were the ones who came up with the time system. And so they're, they're the ones that are gonna answer the 60 second question. Why are there 60 seconds in a, in a minute? So first of all, there's different ways to use your hands to count. And this is the first sort of active way. I'm gonna ask you to kind of uh, use your hands to count. I'm gonna just start counting. And if you can, uh, I'm gonna freeze that one number. If you could just kind of freeze your hand where it is. And if you'd be willing to show us, I wanna, sh I wanna see how many different ways we have of counting. Uh, so I'm just gonna start counting. And if you use your hand, count out. One, two, three is a good place to stop. Now I started here, so you might see some of you. I see a cousin over here, so we got to do that similar way. Okay, you probably went from the back side up. You started with the thumb and went up, so that's a, another way. Okay, I see a little bit of those. What else? There's a, okay. Oh, you're, you're using your thumb. Yep, count on my fingers. Okay, good. That's, a, that's an advanced counting method. Good. Um, and you're using, the, okay, good, good. So you're close to what we're doing. So, uh, I mean, I, I actually wanted to be a history teacher, so I do a lot of reading. That's where my reading is. And so this, I, got, I have this huge book on the history of mathematics. And these are actual research ways of different tribal groups or ethnic groups, the way they count. And so some, uh, we'll just call it tribe A, use the, you know, they start with the thumb and they go up. This is one we didn't see, maybe, or maybe we did. Uh, some people start, this is zero and they count down, so this would be five. So notice the difference between five and five. So there's a cultural difference here, you know? I'm on one side of the bank and I said, the guy over there, hey, give me five fish. He looks over and he says, that guy's not hungry, I'm not gonna give him any fish, and all of a sudden a war starts, right? Because we didn't understand how we count. 
Uh, see, here's a, a sort of an advanced way where you kind of um, change your digits as you go. Uh, and then this is sort of my tribe. I just, you know, because I need the thumb to hold the rest of the things down pretty much. And you count up that way. So different ways. But all of these, again, oftentimes in math, in different language groups, the words for the numbers actually also come from what they would call the fingers. And so it's important, you know, this is, if this is sort of one in your language, you want to start off with one, two, three. Uh, this is, you know, so there's different ways to count. There's other bases too. Uh, some as we were looking, you, you can see that, you know, we were counting a whole finger as one, but that's maybe not as efficient because you've got little three, three little slices there. So you could get actually 14 out of a whole hand if you look over here. And then 14 and 14 is what? 28. So yeah, we'll do a little bit of math here. So 28. Uh, what's the significance of 28? Thinking of uh, maybe next month. February has 28 days, right? That's February is the leftover is a lunar month. There are 28 days in the cycle of a moon. From full moon to full moon, 28 days. Most <coughs> indigenous cultures use the moon as our timekeeping, so that was a month uh, until they got to the Romans and they used the sun, and so we were, we're based off of a solar calendar rather than a lunar one. But February's left over to remind us what a, a lunar month looks like. Uh, in indigenous cultures, also, uh, women, uh, a, a menstrual cycle is about 28 days. In fact, uh, in native culture, we call that the woman is on her moon because it, it lines up with the cycle of the moon. In Indochina, what they would do, what women would do, is because in their culture, the conception of the child was, the, the day of conception was important to know. In fact, more important than the day of birth, the birth that you know, child came out. But the, when was that child conceived? So what they would do is they would tie a ribbon around their finger for the day of the month, because they're on a, month, a lunar calendar, of when they, the last cycle ended, so then they would know, hey, it, it didn't come, and so then they could think, okay, we had relations on this, that, this was the night of conception. So this was a way of using mathematics, using the hand to actually keep track of time um, and go forward. All right. Um, there's also the back of the hand, uh, and this is a, a system that was used in, uh, I believe came out of some of the Arab countries and, and you can count the knuckles on the back you get to 19 at the tip of the finger which then the next one would be 20 so a base 20 system I've also seen people uh, uh, there was a friend of mine his, his grandmother was Chickasaw and she said when, when she counted she would count to 10 and then she'd count to finish counting to 20 on the back side but she would count in her own language and the numbers were different all the way up to 20. So there's, there's languages that use a base 20 system. And then also on the islands, you don't have to wear shoes because you got nice soft sand to walk on. And so there are actually cultures where fingers and toes together make the 20. And uh, the, the words they would call each of the toes and the fingers went with the words they would use in their math for the numbers. So what I want you to see is that mathematics is connected it's a human endeavor that we designed, right? We saw the hand in different ways, and so our cultures made different mathematics. And that's why, as we go through, sometimes we're struggling because we're thinking, oh, math was handed down by the tablets or the universe has one type of math. No, it's a human endeavor. Yes, we can have these different types of maths and use them to still go to the moon or whatever we're going to do, uh, but, we need it's a language that we need to talk together and some of us are if we're using this versus this we might not be speaking in the same language so we have to translate and so mathematics has all of this but how many of you were ever taught that no i never was i just i i was bored one summer that's when i did all this reading uh now 60 seconds in a minute where does that come from? It, it comes from the hands Think about it. I want you to just kind of build up for this because this is 
I always wondered, because it was always, I thought, there's got to be an easy way to do math with time, you know, if you, you can't, you know, quarter tell and you got to add this and you got to, it's just so hard. So from the Babylonians, uh, they used their thumb as a tool to do the counting and then they could trace along and they could actually fill those lines. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve, a dozen. How many of you speak English? In the English language, we use a dozen a lot, don't we? English speaking, and, and English, we all are, we, the Babylonians were an empire, uh, so much of the English language really comes from down from that area, from that empire that went out. Uh, modern day Baghdad, I believe, was uh, where Babylon was. But that was a way of counting. Well, there's our 12. What do you think they did with the other hand? Could count for another 12, right? You get the 24. I mean, that's where the 24 hours comes from. But they, they, and maybe some did, but there's another use we could do with this. How could we get a bigger number using this hand? We could keep track of how many 12s we got, right? So we can't put a 12, we got one 12, we got 24, 36, 48, 60. So we got a sort of a base five over here. We use these five fingers to keep track of how many 60s or how many 12s we've gotten. There's our 60. A, a base 60 system that's a mathematics. That's where trigonometry comes from. That's why there's 360 degrees in a circle. We're going to talk about that like halfway through the class because that's six 60s. Right, um, and yet you know that's why there's 12 inches in a foot because it's kind of measuring, not the metric system measuring. That measuring that we that we've used in America, 12 inches in a foot, it comes from these people, the Babylonians. And then up in, you know, again they had this empire that went throughout the world, and so a lot of people picked up that mathematics. Uh, so 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, so forth and so on. That's why you can do a dozen eggs, right? Because it's cultural. But I, I've taught in, I went, taught in Kazakhstan for a year, high school there, uh, and I was on, Kazakhstan is actually an Asian country, um, although I lived in Uralsk, which is on the, their river is the border between Europe and, and Asia, uh, but they still, they, they primarily are Asian-based culture, and when I go down to buy my eggs, they were in a bag, so you gotta carry them carefully, but they were only 10. So they grouped things by 10 because, as we're gonna see, Asian-based mathematics comes from a different place. And we're gonna see that. So this is the Babylonian mathematics, which did influence the world. Uh, it's going to influence our perspective as we go through our trigonometry. So we wanna remember that as we go from algebra over to trigonometry, we are actually making a cultural switch. We're, we're having to think in a different sort of way. Okay, so and it's all based upon how humans saw their hands. That's the basis of all of this. They then embedded in their language, and and this is where I go to an Asian language. Again, one I'm somewhat familiar with is this is a Thai language. Uh, these are the numbers from 1 through 10, and most people will stop. You, know, you just need to learn the words for 1 through 10. But where you really start to understand the mathematics of a language is what happens after 10. In Thai, notice the word for 10 is sip. And you know, 11 becomes sip at. A kind of a change, because sip nung is not nice to say or something, so sip at. And then sip song, sip song. So you see it's 10 with two more, 10 with three more. It is perfectly a base 10 language. I taught many different cultures and Japanese students will say, yeah, our language works this way. Uh, so as far as Chinese students will tell me, yes, our language works this way. Uh, the other thing is when they get to the 20s, 30s, notice where the, sip, the 10 goes afterwards. So this is also making it more clear. We're gonna see in English, it doesn't, the clarity's not really there. So there's psalms at th three tens. And then the other way you see it's a base 10 is when you get to 100, 1,000. Um, they have different words for all these powers of 10. 
So 100,000 is not 100. In, in English, we think of 1,000, we've got 100 of them. In Thai, they think they just got one san, 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 I think it is. My, my accent's very bad, so. Um, but they, they will actually have different words for each of the powers of 10. So as, as you study languages, if you look at the, the language, how they speak about their mathematics, you start to see how they see math. Uh, and one of the things I'm getting at is, uh, I'm, I'm actually more, I'm a, my degrees are in math education, and I always say it's heavy on the education side, light on the math, because you know, I almost didn't get through the math, but I got through far enough, but it's more about the learning part for me. And so, um, and I just forgot where I was going with that, but anyway, uh, language, English. Okay, we, we know English. What happens, we, we know the word in English for 10 is 10, right? So 10. But where do you see it? Do you see it? Does 11 have the word 10 in it? Now, some people will say, well, that's if you go into the ancient uh, Irish tongue or something, that it kind of means what, one more than 10 or something. But it's, it's, not, it's not obvious to me. 12 does not seem to have that word of 12. You know, I used to call it 12 T. The reason is because my mom said when I became when I was a kid, if you, when you become a teenager, you will get all these, you know, you get to stay up late, you get to do that stuff. And so when I became 12, I said, Mom, I'm a teenager. I, I think I actually did it at 11, but it didn't work so well. But she says, no, I says, well, I'm more than 10, so I'm 11 teen, I'm 12 teen, right? That's a teenager, right? That's what it should be in my math. And that was a part for me that didn't seem to make sense. At school, they were saying we group everything by 10. Well, we group everything by 10. Why doesn't our language do it? it? Our language was messing me up. And it messes you up at an early stage in life. Um, and then the other part is you've got 13, and look at the word for 30. How many of you, you know, even when you're listening, did you say 13 or did you say 30? Notice in Thai, when they did 30, they switched where the 10 was, right? They don't do this here in English. And so, um, our, because our language was not based on base 10. It wasn't based on grouping by 10, it was based on grouping by 12 from the Babylonians, right? So, uh, anyway, our language is problematic for mathematics. How about Spanish? Any Spanish speakers here? All right, so, uh, oops, let's go to the next one. So, yeah, this just kind of highlights it. Let's see, where are we? Yeah, I'm gonna, we'll keep you on. The other thing is I'm gonna give you an assignment at the end, so we're gonna get out a little, your assignment will be make sure you got the book. If you've already got the book, you've got your assignment done. If you don't, we're gonna get you out here a little bit early so you can get to the bookstore and get that done. Okay. Anyway, none of this is on a test, but what it hopefully will help you get comfortable with is as you think about how you're learning math. So, uh, Spanish, the yes. edits. Again, I apologize for my Spanish accent. It's, not really a Spanish accent, it's an English accent, I'm trying to sound Spanish, but it is for 10. Is, it, is that pretty close? So, but we don't see the Diaz in, in the 11, so we'll say, they'll say, Tracy, or say, Kinsey. No 10 yet, right? Where does the 10 come in? Yes, say, say, it's literally 10 with six more. Yes, say, Seven. <laughs> ten, 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 seven more. Okay. Yeah, so good. I took Spanish 101 like four times, and I could never. I get about halfway through, and then I get busy, and uh, I just. I love languages, but it's, they don't stick with me for some reason. So anyway, but if you think of the Spanish culture, what's so important? But there's there's some important number. Fifteen is an important number, isn't it? What's embedded in Hispanic culture? Quinceañera. Quinceañera. The girl becomes a woman at 15. I don't know about men, maybe just saw it. Forget about them, but I know the Quincy era is like a huge deal, turning 15. And so that's at least one cultural item where the 15 was so, so important, they got a special word for it. And then they say, okay, we're gonna to go to base 10, so we go down here, okay? So, so Spanish is a system, and again, maybe, I don't know, I haven't looked at all the history, maybe it was a base 20 or something, but culturally, Spanish speakers, 15 was such an important part of their culture, they've embedded it in their numbers. Now here's the deal, is if you spoke English or Spanish as a kid growing up, 
your language was different than the mathematics they were teaching you in school. Okay? And if you look at international tests for up to fourth grade and then eighth grade, English speakers and Spanish speakers do far worse than Asian speakers. And again, they look at maybe it's the culture, maybe it's a, I say it's just as simple as the language. If you have a language that's base 10, not this one, you're gonna be doing better in a math that's base 10. And uh, the backup I have for that is a lot of native languages, Native American languages, uh, they actually have a base 10 in here. So this is the Pasquiaki language. Uh, and and it's, it's actually got a lot of stuff in here, but, but their 10 is actually two fives, Omani. And then when they get to 11, you see the word for 10 with the word for one. So you see that the structure of this language is base 10. Um, and then it's also got a base 20 in here because the, the, the Pasquiaki traveled down. They were with the Mayans who had a base 20. Uh, they also have a base eight here. If you look at the word for eight, eight is two fours. Uh, they picked that up from the Chumash who were on the uh, California coast. The Chumash had a base eight because they put sticks, they counted with sticks. And so there's four, there's spaces for four sticks in here. So it's four and four, eight was their 10, okay? And these folks traveled over and lived with them for a couple hundred years. And so they picked up their mathematics as well and they embedded it in their language. You know, it's kind of cool. Uh, this is the language of my mother's people, and you count to 10, Madashwe, and then 11, Madashwe, Asai, Beshwe. And again, apologize, my, even my Chippewa uh, accent is very terrible. But uh, you can see the base 10 format of this. And so what I saw is because I do a lot of work with tribal nations, and when they do language revitalization, oftentimes, they don't change anything about the math, but simply by using their, their language, which is a base 10 language, they do better in math. So here's the deal. I don't know, I, you know, I know I'm not gonna be able to say, okay, America, you need to change your language, uh, but maybe the, we could change the way we talk about it. Maybe we'd go for 11 teen and 12 teen. That's my, bet, but nobody's listening to me, right? So, but becoming aware of it, that this is an issue or could be an issue, might have been one of the issues that held you back when you were learning these things. Um, language is a deal, okay? So now we're gonna talk about the modern mathematics throughout the world. Where does it come from? Well, we were talking about base 10 and how we do that. And we talk, here's a Thailand over here. This is an, an older map from 475. Uh, what do you notice is at the center of this map? Put a nice red line around it so that you could catch it. What's in the center of the world? The empire, which we now call modern day India. There was actually two schools of mathematics in India. There's one in the north, uh, Mohenjo Dara area, and there was one towards the south, down along here. The one in the north, all everything north of there, the, the Asian, or the, uh, sorry, the Arab empires, Asia they started to write their numbers the same way they did in the north of India. It was a base 10 system, okay? Metric system. The, the system we're using today comes from there. Uh, to the south, this went down, so Southeast Asia, they picked up a, it's also base 10, but they had a different way of writing their numbers. So like in Thailand, they have uh, a, a Thai numerals. They write them differently, but they use them the same, their mathematics is the same but they write them different. Cambodia has a, a way of writing the numbers that are different, all based on that. But can't you see it? It's, if, you, if you looked at the world this way, not that there's nothing on the other side, but at this point in time, what's in the center? India. And it was from there that the mathematics went. The, the Arabs came, and that's the algebra that we're gonna talk about, came from the Arabs. Algebra is an Arab. Arabic word, which means to basically take apart and put back together. So they came to India and studied, and then they took it to that part of the world. Chinese studied it, everything else. So um, what I'm gonna share with you, yeah, we're right on track. Uh, 
there's a, a type of mathematics called Vedic mathematics. Now, some people say it's, it was sort of rediscovered at the, around 1911. Uh, really got, a guy was really smart, got all these degrees and everything. Um, was, I can't say his name right, so <laughs> I won't say it. But uh, he went out into the wilderness. He read some of the Veda books, the, the ancient books from thousands of years ago. And he found out six sort of sutras that could describe all the mathematics. Um, and his mathematics helped to use the left and right side of the brain, uh, get an interest in numbers. You're able to calculate things quickly. Uh, and people who have learned these methods are gain a, a good proficiency. The other thing is in India, the importance of doing mathematics, it was a mental process. So it was more about how you could do it in your head and you know if you're right, you're right. When it got to the West, uh, well the map's gone, when it got over to the Europe, it was a new mathematics. So everything had to be written. Now how many of you in, in your math careers I've been told, well, you have to show your work or you get no points, right? And yet I work with many students who are very good at looking at, they'll get the answer like this again and again and quick. And I go, I can't do, I can't do that. So, and the teacher says, I can't do that. So you gotta show your work. So you must be cheating because that's the only way to do it, right? Show your work. Well, that's a, again, that's a Western cultural perspective because it's a foreign mathematics and they, they weren't comfortable with it. Yet it comes from a culture that prided itself on doing mathematics all in, in the mind. So we, we run into these even to today. Okay. The good news is that on our, on our tests, they're all multiple choice. So when you're taking a test in here, you don't have to show any work. You can show work or you don't have to. Oh, no. So it's kind of, we'll, we'll keep with that. So I like this uh, poem, it's from the Sanskrit. I uh, like the crest of the peacock, like the gem on the head of a snake, so is mathematics at the head of all knowledge. So mathematics is, not really a system by itself. It's a, it's a language for talking about quantity. It's a language we use um, as we, we've been talking. And so what I'm gonna introduce to you, and this is kind of where I start to get into the syllabus. I, this is sort of the rule system I use for my classes uh, because we'll start looking at the culture of learning that was embedded in the Indian ways of doing things. So. One of the things they did is, again, it wasn't just about mathematics, but it was about morality, how you treat each other. So one of the concepts that they hold is that, and again, that, that math guy that I said went off to the wilderness, you know, he, he had gotten his degrees, he was in a place where he could make probably a lot of money. But in India, the thing was not what you own, but what you did, but who you are. And so what they saw is that, that you're the owner of your actions. You don't really own that computer or that car. Those are just things that you use. What you own is your actions. Okay. And there's two types of actions. There's skillful actions and unskillful actions. So if you, if you take everything you do in your life and you divide it here with skillful, here's unskillful, that's the beginning of morality, of, of, of success. And, and what would you call a skillful action? How would you know if something was a skillful action? Anyone? It uh, makes it a change for the better and helps people. There we go. It, it, it did what you wanted it to. Well, hopefully you wanted something good, yeah. But it, it helps, you know, I like that. It helped someone, it got you forward. It was, you know, so we know what it is. We don't have to label it. Now, sometimes one thing could be skillful and another time that same action could be unskillful, right? Uh, if there was a fire in the back and someone yelled, there's a fire, we all run out, that's skillful. If there's not a fire and we yell it, we might get people hurt, right? So it's, it's situational. So good, skillful. Is, and then unskillful would be the opposite of that. It maybe hurt somebody. It maybe didn't, wasn't successful. And so what I want you to do is think about this semester as you do things, what is skillful for you is unskillful. I found I work with students and sometimes maybe watching TV or, or listening to music while you do things helps your mind to focus and, and you're actually, it's actually helpful. Others, they get into the music and then they, oh, oh, I forgot my homework. So it could be skillful or unskillful. It depends on us. We've got to decide that. Um, 
And again, they don't like me saying that. They want, they want uh, you know, most. The other thing is a syllabus. I didn't write that. I sometimes go back and go through it, but they, they give me a syllabus. So sometimes it may say, these are all the rules. I don't care about rules. What I want you to do is things that are skillful versus unskillful. Because I know some of you, I've had students that will sometimes have like an hour to commute. You know, uh, and then they're going, well, I'm getting this stuff. Do I have to be here in every day in class? And, well, what's more skillful for you? If you stay home and you do the work and you get more done that way, it's, you know, maybe that's more skillful. Well, I, you know, anyway, as far as class rules, this is the two I want to stick to. What I want you to do is figure out what's skillful, what works for you to get you to where you want to go so you don't have to, you know, take a class again. And I want you to develop those. So identify what's skillful for you at those times. Develop it. Do it more because the more you do it, the more good things start happening to your life. Unskillful things, we want to kind of, again, it's not this concept of sin, you're, you know, we need to punish you or you need to punish yourself. Just stop doing it, you know? It's like, uh, one of the things I did is I, I, you know, I know when you're young, alcohol is a, a thing, you, you try it out and stuff. I tried it out too much and it was a, became a very unskillful thing for me. Eventually I let it go and let it go and I found, for me, life was better. My friend said, yeah, you're a much better person when you're not drinking, because when you drink, you're, yeah. So anyway, that was my thing. You know. My other friend says, why can't you just be a social drinker like me? I said, I'm not like you. I said, you, you do fine. I says, me, uh-uh, it's, it's a very unskillful act for me. So we have a different thing. And he owns a bar and stuff. He, you know, I'll go in the bar, but I'm not gonna drink any alcohol because uh, as soon as I do, I, I did it once when I was in Kazakhstan and, and my, life unravel. I stopped drinking for a while. I said, oh, I'm fine. I, don't, I could do this. Uh, nope, I couldn't. So abandon those things that we find unskilled for ourselves. Okay. And again, it's, this is a personal thing. Um, and so that's what I, I say. Those are my only, I, I call them two rules, but they're, I don't know if they're really two rules, but just try to do things that are skillful. When you find things are not working for you, let's talk about it. Let's find different ways of doing things. Um, and sometimes the skillful thing is the, the less obvious thing. Like I had a student who uh, was tested, had a learning disability. They say she needs a quiet room to take tests in. So that we did that, we tried that. And during those quiet rooms, she wasn't doing well. So I said, well, come to class. Then I thought maybe she just needs to ask questions. I says, come to class. I'll have you take it while we're doing something else. It's gonna be a little noisy but at least you'll have me there to ask questions. Well, she didn't have to ask any questions of me. What she found was the noise of the classroom actually helped her focus on her math. And she says, I need to be in a place with noise, not a quiet place. When it was quiet, it wasn't good for the way, you know, she was thinking too many other things. So the experts don't always know what's best, but we generally can figure out what's best for us. So that's, that's basically my rule is, we need to know what's best for us. Um, and I'm gonna share with you just briefly, there's three activities that we can do, three actions that are always skillful because they help us to concentrate. And I, I view math as a topic to build our human development, to build our ability to concentrate because when we concentrate, that's when we, we accomplish things, right? When we, we're able to focus, we're able to solve the problems, we're able to see our problems and awareness. So, uh, and I get, I have to always put in the plug for uh, my wife, Dr. Penton, she got her doctorate in mindfulness and also she came up with a method or a system, a little course. She's focused specifically on reducing stress in teachers. She says, if I can reduce stress in teachers, then the students will have a lot less stress. I was her first, so, so that's where I get all this is I said, yeah, if I reduce my stress, then my students are gonna be less stressed and they're gonna learn. So mindfulness, uh, we'll talk about what that is, alertness and then ardency. Um, so what mindfulness is simply, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of definitions out there, but it's simply keeping something in mind. So you're remembering something. Uh, one thing I'm gonna show you is, is uh, remembering to watch your breath, because you'll see, if you watch your breath, you'll be able to control, to know where you're at anyway. In mathematics, what is the thing we always need to remember? Well, it's the numbers, how they're related to each other. So th that's mindfulness. Alertness, well, that's just active attention. So we're gonna focus on something. We're not just gonna um, 
you know, not pay attention, right? So active, so that, that kind of is clear. Ardency is kind of a weird word, but it's, it's the emotional, it's this intense feeling that we want enjoyment. We want, uh, we want to sort of have passion for what we're doing. So we bring that into it. So mindfulness, we start thinking about something, focusing on something. Uh, we have act attention on it, and then we put our emotion into it until it becomes a, a joyful thing, and then we do it more often. Um, so one of the things I use is I, I use meditation a lot. And all meditation is is we direct our thought, and what we do is we direct our thought to our breath and breathing. So just think about, you know, feel your breath. How many of you, I mean, we breathe all day long, don't we? But how many of you really are conscious of your breathing? Until maybe you're angry and then it's kind of a short breath or something or, or you don't have enough air. But if, you, if you're conscious of your breathing, you just watch your breath a little bit. Like take a deep breath. That's what they always say. Because, and it's not the deep breath that does it as much as we start to pay attention. Then you evaluate it. Oh, yeah, I felt much better. I was getting really tense there. And if I take a deep breath, I, 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 man, I, I can relax. So that's the idea is you direct your thought to the breath. You evaluate it. Was it a good breath? Okay, maybe I could do a little bit better, maybe a little deeper, whatever's needed. And then until you start feeling relaxed, feeling joyful. Same thing with math. You direct your thought. Okay, am I doing well? No? Well, what could I do? I could go get some help from a friend or send an email. And then eventually I'll figure it out. And then it feels good to successfully learn. You know, so we can apply this to anything. So these kind of three actions of just direct our thought on what we're working on. And our breath is always with us. Okay. And I said, I'm, I used to be a Christian minister. I'm now a practicing Buddhist. But I say, it's, you know, the breath is not a Buddhist breath. It's not a Christian breath. It's not a Muslim breath. I've lived with, uh, when I was in Kazakhstan, I lived among Muslims. And so I, I followed their traditions as well. Uh, I, I follow Native American ways of doing things as well. So there's spiritual practices. But the breath, one of those things, watching that and being conscious of it, we all breathe. It's a human thing. Uh, so that's something that can help overcome that math anxiety as well. It's just watch something that you've got with you all that is your breath. And I sometimes do this activity in class, and so I saw, but I'd say, okay, you don't have to do this if you feel like you know I'm trying to lead you down some, you know, convert you into something. Uh, you just stop breathing for a couple of minutes, right? Nobody wants to do that, so everyone's going to breathe. So. Uh, directed thought, I'm breathing, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. So you just watch the in and the out breath. It's as simple as that. You evaluate each breath. Uh, I'm feeling relaxed. Oh, I didn't know my shoulders were so tight. And then once you get it, you're all set. Hey, you're feeling good. I've got students that will do this. They'll go for a morning walk with the dog or whatever, or however you do it. You know, that's, that's their time. Maybe sitting down having a coffee. Whatever, there's, there's multiple ways to practice, but the idea is you focus on yourself until you get yourself to feel in that state where it's good. And maybe if you do that a little bit, you know, you sit down to do your math, one of the things is, is when we're running around doing things, and I always tell you, if you go through this, what you see is when you're, when you're not thinking about your breath, what are you thinking about? Well, you're either thinking about the past or the future, right? Because the breath is right here. So when we're in our present moment, we, we, that's when we get our stuff done. But so often we're thinking, oh, we're, we're scared about something from the past or the future that's coming up, and we're not in the present, right? If we stay in the present, we're able to learn better, faster, deeper, and everything else. Okay, so we'll do this in like five minutes. So now this is the math part of it. So this is one of the places where Vedic math starts. Now, when you were first, second grade, and you looked up at the front of the classroom, what was there above the chalkboard or the whiteboard? Or I'm sure they still have these. There's the ABCs, right, if you're in American classroom or English-speaking classroom. But what was also maybe up there? A number line, right? You've seen these. Uh, but in India, they, they look at number circles because there's a relationship between numbers that are always the same when you see them in circles. So. Uh, one of the first sutras that come up is uh, in Sanskrit, it's written below by one more than before. So you start with one, 
that's the creation. We, we've got nothing, we've got one, so mathematically that's a thing. And then one more than before is how we build the numbers. So what comes after one? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10. So we've built the, the base 10 system. We, we counting on our fingers, however. As we've got it in the circle, do you see any patterns between the numbers? And I tell you, there's all sorts of patterns. I've got a book filled with pages of number circles that I've, and I've got, you know, triplets of numbers. But what I want you to focus on the 10. And if you look to either side of the 10, what do you start to see? See that nine and one are 10. There, okay. Eight and two are 10. Seven and three, ten. Six and four, ten. Five and five, ten. So these are what are called the complements to ten. So this was the beginning of. So this is the mindfulness part of mathematics. You kept track that these these are like partners. You, you know, you see a couple going together. You know, two friends, three friends. Well, at, you know, a group. You, you just you see one, you think of the other, right? That's this math. You see nine, you think of one. You see one, you think of nine, because those are the complements. Um, there's also the complements of nine, the circle of nine. And what I like doing with this one is, where does, should the two go? Well, why not go the other way, anti-clockwise? You know, that's the nice thing with circle, is you could go either direction. And so you kind of see, and, and culturally, I have two good uh, friends, they're, they're elders. One was from the uh, Lakota nation, and they always go sunwise, let's see, sunwise. So, so they would go, I can't remember which, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. But they, they, they would go sunwise. And he met a good friend of his, was from the Nez Perce people, who go the opposite direction. So they were at a conference and they met each other because they, other cultures, they would go different ways. He says, if we were of the same culture, we would have been behind each other, probably never met each other. But we just saw each other, we shook each other's hands, and we made this connection. So sometimes being different, that's where we pick these things up. So anyway, what you see here, if you look at the nine, same type of thing, you get complements of nine. And so this is the mindfulness part of mathematics that in the Vedic system, what they do is they, they focus on learning these and you're able to do this, uh, you're able to do subtraction, addition, by grouping by tens. Um, and the nine actually does have one because there's this uh, little thing called zero that we have. So nine and zero are also nine. So that would be the complements to nine. So there's a whole mathematics that if you know the complements to 10, you know the complements to nine, you put them together in a way, and you can actually do subtraction. Uh, I won't teach it to here. I, it's about a two hour workshop I've done. I've taught it. Uh, it's where I always hated doing subtraction because I was taught to do it the, the Western way or the, the school way here. When I learned this way, it actually, it felt fun. And I start doing subtraction just by, because I could do it mentally, and I did it with mindfulness by just having in mind the complements of nine, the complements of 10. So I'm gonna build on it a little bit because I, I wanna show you how to use your hands, like I said. Uh, so if we wanna multiply eight times seven, how many of you know what eight times seven is? 56. Personally, I don't. Because when I was a kid, I made up my own flashcards and I made, up, I, I made them up wrong. I had eight times seven, I had the answer for nine times six, right? Because one's 56, one's 54. I wrote them down wrong, but I memorized them really good. I memorized the wrong fact really good, so even to today, I get mixed up, but watch. We're gonna be able to do this. So, complement of eight is what? Two, complement to 10, right? So here's eight, I got eight fingers up, two down. So what I'm gonna do is use that complement idea is, so I'm going to just say that this is eight because you know this is all five over here because I want to use this other hand to, to represent seven. Seven. What's the complement of seven? Three, right? So that's seven, three down. So if I let's see if I can do this. So now if I'm going to multiply these, there's a method where I take the up fingers and I, I count them each as ten. So how many fingers do I have up in the air? I've got five, so that's fifty, and then the down fingers. Again, I'm, I'm using this part of the brain, right? I'm not using the amygdala now, I'm using the, this part. I bump them together, two times three is six, 50, 
six. And I do that because there's an activity here. Uh, bumping means <coughs> multiply, putting together means adding. 56. It worked, right? And, we, and you all knew that, but now I do this under the table. Oh yeah, it's 56, not 54. Because that's the fact that I have, to, I have to remember which one. I know it's one of the two. Um, so complements, we add and count them as tens, and then we multiply the, the base down here. But the cool part is, is this method works for everything else. So here's my, and you see why I'm not an art teacher now, so this is my, uh, so this is uh, eight, two down, three up. This is six, four down, right, complement. And so what we're gonna get is we're gonna get 40, four times two is eight, 48, right? So if I go like that, that takes some practice, but you can start doing this. And when you're, you know, and it's a method that all you have to do is remember up to five times five, right? Because you do need to know that four times two is, is eight, but you don't have to know anything of the, all the other ones come about. And so, you know, and so many, especially young kids, again, they're dealing with that their language, they're learning English, and that their language is not base 10, and yet they're being told by the math teacher, you know, our math is base 10, but their language is lying to them. You know, this is different, they're using a different language. And then they're just told to memorize all these things, and, and sometimes they memorize the wrong things, like me, and you know, so how do they get through this? But here's a method that you can go through uh, now the harder one is something like seven times six because uh, seven is three down, six is four down. And people, oh, that's only 30. I know that seven times six is like 40 something, right? Well, it is because there's, there's 30, but then you've got three times four, which is 12. So you have to carry over. 12 plus 30 is 42. So we get it. The thing is, is though you see that when we have mathematics and we have a carry, that's a little, you know, mentally it's an extra thing to do. Okay, so there is methods for doing that. Um, what I'm gonna do, let's see, how much time do we have? Yeah, we're right about, we've got 15 minutes, but I don't wanna take 15 minutes of your time. Let's not save. Um, I wanna show you our system that we've got. Get you. How many of you have gone into our Canvas course already? A few, not all of you. Because um, there's not a lot there, but um, so I'll, I'll just pull it up and I'll show you the important things. Because basically, what we'll, we'll get going full speed ahead when we uh, on Thursday is a, the goal. Is that you'll you'll all have the book. You'll all have the. Um, this oh, we got all, everybody, 125. We're completely full now. So let's go into Canvas. There's a lot of stuff I have that I haven't shown you yet. So I, I do have recordings from last semester when I taught this. I, I don't know if they're good or not, so I'm, I've got them hidden from your view. Uh, we'll go to just student view. So this is all you'll see. There's the syllabus here. Um, and again, take a look over it. It's got information. Uh, the main thing is, is you, what you need to do is you need to buy a book from the bookstore. Um, it's called, I guess maybe we'll open it up. Let's see. Pre-calculus, Pathways to Calculus, 9th edition. There'll be a access code in the front cover. You go to this website, set up a login. You put I in that. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Quiet. Uh, you'll get that access code, you'll enter it in, and it will get you to the online part of the class. The book you get is, is a workbook, um, which you're welcome to bring. I, I typically, those also are available electronically, so I have it. There's not a great need for the printed version, except that it has that access code that gets you the online stuff. So if you can get that. We do have, because this course is taught a little different than the other pre-calculus, we do have a special tutoring. They're gonna be getting that set up, so don't worry about that, but there's a, a Zoom channel once we have, and I'll post that, that calendar so you can go there and get uh, people who are actually teaching the course, IAs that are actually, they'll teach you in the way that this course is gonna be helpful. Because a lot of it, again, is, it's about learning a language to talk about things that's gonna help you to do better with calculus. Um, 
So that's all here. Let's see what's so the workbook. You get it. Get get online. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a little bit of time in class. Uh, if anyone isn't, bring your laptop and stuff. We'll make sure you're all able to get on. Uh, that took some problem. And uh, you should have a calculator for this course. Again, at the beginning, it's not as critical, but um, TI-84 is one, or 83. Um, there's a lot of them out there. You get a used one. Uh, any graphing calculator will do, but uh, we've got some videos that show you how to use a TI-84. You can borrow one. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. What I, the other part I have is I took a screenshot of the calendar that's also, this is just in the, uh, in the syllabus as well. Notice we were supposed to get in 2.1, I'm just gonna move it down here. What I've gotten is each week, um, we've got a certain amount of work to do. They're all gonna have due dates of Sunday. So there's, there's two parts to the course, each lesson. There's a lesson part where basically you get full credit as long as you get about half of it done. And that's got some activities in there that help you learn the content. We'll start doing some of those on Thursday. Um, and then there's a, a homework part, which is based on it. That's more just kind of, this is how you do things. But the, the lesson part's a little bit more teaching, learning as you do it. And then there's the homework part. If you finish the homework part, you will get full credit for both. So you might find sometimes, oh, I don't really need to do the lesson. I could just jump in and do the homework. That's fine. If you finish the homework, you'll get full points. Okay, uh, and I, every week has a due date of Sunday night. No, no, actually I moved it since we don't have class on Monday, Monday night. So you have till Monday night to get the previous weeks done. If you don't, there's something called a late pass. I'll give you like a hundred of them. Uh, late pass extends it for 72 hours. So you won't have to contact me, just use a late pass, you'll be able to get it done and it'll update the scores. But the goal is, is to try to keep on track because uh, if you get down here, and we're ready for the test and you haven't done anything yet, that's a lot of work to get caught up on, right? So if we can kind of try to keep on track, but you know, again, maybe it's, uh, I gotta go help a friend out, that was the most skillful thing to do, so I didn't get my homework done, I'll use a late pass, I'll get it done. Um, so I gotta fit these things in my life, I got a paper due in this class, I got, you know, you got all that stuff going on, use your, your thoughts to get yourself in the most skillful position. We'll work with you with flexibility, to get you where you can learn the content. Uh, and then we've got an exam down here, we'll, we'll cover it, and they are pretty consistent. Uh, someone else, the, the coordinator, comes up with the exams, but they are very, they're worded, some of them almost exactly like the homework. And sometimes they change the numbers. In fact, one of the qu test questions, he didn't even change the numbers, it was exactly a homework problem. So if you work that homework problem, you actually already did the test question. So we're gonna have those. There's other things that there's some practice stuff in there that what they, you know, some of the skills based stuff, they're not necessarily points and stuff, but we want you to uh, so help you with the skills and stuff. Um, yes. Is homework graded based on accuracy or just completion? Uh, completion. And you get multiple, it's all online stuff, so you get, it'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. And if you're wrong, then there's, uh, there's, you can hit a button and it'll send it to the forum and we can answer questions. So the goal is we're all going to get them. Um, we're going to get them all right. Um, but I think it gives you like five attempts, so don't, um, don't just ran, if you're not, if you're just guessing, that's probably not the best way to go. Try to say, oh, I'd at least ha like to have some kind of method behind it. So if I get it wrong and I know I'm just guessing, don't, don't try to guess five times because then you don't have it, right? But uh, we'll work, you know, in class we'll, we'll answer questions. We've got various ways working together. Uh, we'll get us, we'll get us all through there. Um, and again, there's, there's a few other things, but there's, there's three exams. You can, you can see that in the uh, syllabus. Another thing they say don't tell you, but I will tell you, is that uh, if you do really poorly on an exam, because maybe some of you are thinking, what if I bomb an exam? Well, we take, the final's comprehensive, and what they've done is they nicely, they break it down to three parts. So we know this first part of the exam was test one, and what they'll allow us to do is if you did really bad on one of the exams, let's say, exam one, usually that's the one because that's the first time you took it. You do better on the final exam, say you got a 40 on the first test, but on the final, by the final, that portion that has those questions from that, you got a 90, I get to put a 90 in place of the 40. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, we do that for one of them. So there's, there's kind of, they call it like a re resurrection final. So the, the thing is, is what we're looking at is that by the time you're done, you've learned the material. 
we don't want to grade you on the struggle that you had to get there. Uh, we want to reward the end result that you learned the material, you're going to do well. And then when you go into your calculus class, how many of you are planning on taking calculus after this? Most of you probably should be, because if you're not, then occasionally this is a final class, but most of you are going on to calculus and you're going to want to have that confidence going into it. That Because the, the hardest part of calculus, I, I taught calculus last semester, it's not the calculus, it's the algebra and the trig behind it, because and it's just they use it differently. It's, it's a moving algebra. It's a moving trigonometry within the calculus. And, and that's what we're going to see here. So that's the goal is that not only will you have the content knowledge, the skills, but you'll also see it in the way that will be most useful when you get to your calculus class. And you'll do well there. Um, any questions? Okay. Enjoyed meeting you. Actually, I guess it was sort of a one-sided meeting, but uh, now I get the rest of the semester to listen to you and, and get there. What's your assignment today? Get the workbook. And get registered by Thursday for the online stuff so we can come in here and just get moving.